Welcome to the Russian Rulers Podcast, Episode 72. Comrade Lenin, we hardly knew you. Last time, the Bolsheviks were faced with three major crises once they gained power in November of 1917. The first, ending Russian involvement in World War I. The second, the Russian Civil War. And the third, and most critical, the famine and unrest of 1921. Successful in resolving crises one and two, Lenin moved on to number three. Known as a staunch idealist, Lenin's brilliance lay not in his intransient or unwavering insistence on clinging to one way of doing things, but his realistic attitude in deciding when to change direction when things were not going on as planned. He had to change directions when he realized that the Russian Revolution was not spreading throughout Europe as he had envisioned, and that his people would have to go at it alone. He also understood that the peasants and industrial workers were not as avid ideologues as he was, and that they were not going to just give up their wares to the government out of goodwill. Something had to change. So, Lenin proposed a new economic policy known by his acronym, acronym NEP or NEP. In it, instead of total socialism, small forms of capitalism would be allowed. While large industry remained in the hands of the government, the NEP allowed private ownership of business of less than 20 employees as well as retail establishments. It is in the countryside that the biggest changes occurred with the advent of the Kulak class of peasant. The more industrious you were, the more you were rewarded. These Kulak farmers became the new privileged class in the country, a class whose membership in was to prove deadly when Stalin came to power. Now, many communists were disturbed by this change in policy, as was the polar opposite to the ideas of their glorious revolution of the proletariat and their socialist ideals. But the realist that was Lenin argued that this was but a temporary retreat, which was necessary in order to help the Russian economy recover. The new economic policy was a smashing success, but not without some caveats. The Russians did not do this alone. A little known fact was the not inconsequential humanitarian aid that they received from an unusual source. Herbert Hoover through the American Relief Administration, and the Quakers. Now, America was in the midst of an economic boom known to all of us as the Roaring Twenties. The U.S. felt that by spreading the wealth, so to say, was the righteous and moral thing to do and be damned with the differences of political opinion held by the Russian communists. A large number of young Americans felt a kinship in liking for their Soviet comrades, but this would come back to haunt some of them when the U.S. was ravaged by the Red Scare persecutions under Joseph McCarthy in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Production from both the industrial and the agricultural side boomed. People's lives on the whole improved immensely. Money was being made, freedom of expression was being relaxed, and there was an air of optimism. Maybe, just maybe, this communism thing was going to work after all. Partly due to the generosity of America, its culture began to seep through Russia. Jazz clubs opened up and music began to be heard in the streets of Moscow, Petrograd, and the rest of the country's cities. Now, it was here that I was going to say that according to a Russian history lecture I listened to recently, uh, that the favorite song in Russia during this period was Chattanooga Choo Choo. But, because I tend to double-check things, I discovered that the song was only released in 1941. Even well-respected, internationally known history professors do get it wrong. Anyway, American jazz was very popular in Russia in the mid-1920s. Lenin was on top of the world in the eyes of his people. A cult of personality began to arise, which would eventually be exploited by his successor. Stalin began to feed into this cult brilliantly, as he seemingly had the foresight that this would benefit him in the future. 
and he was proven to be oh so right. The Russian people yearned to have someone to worship, as they had for so many years before. But there were many groups that suffered greatly under Lenin, two more than any others, the Cossacks and the Russian Orthodox Church. The Church to the Bolsheviks was the epitome of what was wrong with Russia. Its dogmatic policies and rituals represented the backwardness of the majority of the people. It was keeping the people ignorant and compliant to an autocratic system that was a blockade to a free and just society. And to top it off, most of the communists in power were avowed atheists. Lenin, despite his Russian Orthodox upbringing, rejected the church. Trotsky, for his part, being Jewish, despised the church in most part for its complacency during the pogroms of the 19th century, started under Alexander III, and carried on by Nicholas II. You know, it's still somewhat ironic that they so hated the church, yet they created an entity called communism, which was very much like a church in behavior, if not name. The first act by Lenin to undermine the church was to confiscate all church property and bring it into the fold of the newly formed Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the USSR, which I'll get to in a minute. Secondly, thousands of priests, bishops, and devout followers were either executed or banished to labor camps in Siberia. Then what I'd like to call the coup de grace was delivered. Time was changed. Now, until January 31st, 1918, the Church and all of Russia followed the Julian calendar, started almost 2,000 years before, and under the guise of it was to keep up with the times of Christ. But on that day, January 31st, all of Russia was ordered to drop 13 days, vault into the future, and adopt the Gregorian or Western calendar. Your humble podcaster, though, is ecstatic with this change as now I am infinitely less confused as to the date of historical occurrences in Russia. One example of the confusion is the Bolshevik Revolution. It has been no, known historically as the October Revolution, except that it occurred in November. Well, the old calendar was still in use in 1917, so theoretically, according to that, it was started in October if you follow the old calendar which is still followed by some in the Russian Orthodox Church. Now for an explanation of the formation of the USSR. In December of 1918, delegates of the Russian SFSR, the Transcaucasian SFSR, the Ukrainian SSR, and the Belarusian SSR approved the Treaty of Creation of the USSR and the Declaration of the Creation of the USSR forming the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. These two documents were confirmed by the First Congress of Soviets of the USSR and signed by the heads of the delegations, Mikhail Kalinin, Mikhail Shashkaya, Mikhail Frunz, Grigory Petrovsky, and Alexander Cheryakov on 30th of December 1922 signed these papers. They started with five countries, but the USSR would eventually grow into 15 republics by 1956. By 1922, another major issue was causing a stir in the USSR, and that was Lenin's health. Following the assassination attempt in 1918, his health was faltering, but things began to really deteriorate when he suffered the first of three strokes in 1922. Now, the first two strokes were minor in nature, but were debilitating enough to slow Lenin down considerably. The Bolshevik high command, led by the likes of Trotsky, Kamenev, Zinoviev, and Stalin, downplayed the situation to the public. Comrade Lenin was ill, but he was still at the helm, powerful in his conviction to lead his people and the world to a glorious future. Behind the scenes, there was an unquiet feeling that Lenin was not long for this world, and that major players were jockeying for position to take over when the eventual death of the great leader occurred. 
At this time, two factions were being created, the left, led by Trotsky, and the right, led by Zanoviev and Bukharnin. Stalin brilliantly stayed back on the sidelines, although leaning to the right because of his deep dislike for Trotsky. The battle for ideological control of the Communist Party was the utmost importance as Lenin's health was deteriorating rapidly. In 1922, the Cheka was disbanded and replaced by the GPU. New powers were given to the new secret police, the most important being the right to arrest party members. This was to give Lenin, and later Stalin, the ability to quash any dissent. Felix Dzerzhinsky was to lead the GPU, as he did the Cheka. Stalin was now appointed the General Secretary of the Communist Party, with the express intent of getting rid of the party and pesky dissenters. He took to this new job with zeal. He removed anyone who questioned Lenin's policies and replaced them with people loyal to himself. This was to aid Stalin in gaining control of the country after Lenin died. Lenin, knowing that his health was failing, began to write something known as The Testament, where he evaluated each of his successors, or the potential successors. He knew that two main players after his death would be Stalin and Trotsky, with secondary players being Zinoviev, Kamenev, Bukharnin, and Pyatakov. Here is what he had to say about the two big boys. Quote, Comrade Stalin, having become general secretary, has concentrated unlimited power in his hands, and I am not convinced that he will always manage to use this power with sufficient care. On the other hand, Comrade Trotsky, as is shown by his struggle against the Central Committee in connection with the question of the People's Commissar of the Means of Communication, is characterized not only by outstanding talents. To be sure, he is personally the most capable person in the present Central Committee, but he also overbrims with self-confidence and with an excessive preoccupation with the purely administrative side of things. Lenin castigated Zinoviev and Kamenev for their behavior during the November Revolution, thought Bukharnin too scholastic and not Marxist enough, and Pyatakov as being too administrative. Robert Service, in his book, Lenin, A Biography, a book I highly recommend, had this to say about Lenin's testament, quote, The hypocrisy here was stunning. Lenin, too, had ruled with insufficient care, Stalin, had been addictive, addicted to administrative methods, Trotsky and Pyatakov, had opposed revolutionary over-optimism, Zinoviev and Kamenev, and had exhibited a dubious grasp of Marxist orthodoxy, Ukharnin. Yet, Lenin now contended that only his comrades were guilty of these inadequacies. By now, though, Lenin was trying to get rid of Stalin, and Stalin knew it. Lenin went on writing about how things should be done, and in the letters he constantly criticized Stalin. Lydia Fotieva, a secretary to Lenin, took down the following from the, from the leader. Quote, Stalin is too crude, and this deficit which is entirely acceptable in our milieu and in relationships among us as communists, becomes unacceptable in the position of general secretary. I therefore propose to comrades that they should devise a means of removing him from this job and should appoint to this job someone else who is distinguished from comrade Stalin in all other respects, only by the singular superior aspect that he should be more tolerant more polite and more attentive towards comrades, less capricious, etc. Lenin then urged Trotsky to challenge Stalin for power, but Trotsky foolishly turned him down. Stalin, for his part, kept his cool external facade, but he was seething inside. Lenin, though, had suffered his third stroke, which left him totally debilitated. In Moscow, the two sides began to make their move. Trotsky published his work, The New Course, which was critical of the party and their bureaucracy. 
Stalin, Kamenev, Bukharin, and Zinoviev stood united against Trotsky. The 13th Congress was held in early January 1924, and Trotsky and his left wing were crushed. Lenin was lied to and was told everyone was unified. But then, on January 21, 1924, less than seven years after the revolution, Vladimir Ilyich Lenin died at 6.50 p.m. with Bukharin in the room. Bukharin said, quote, When I ran into Ilyich's room, full of doctors and stacked with medicines, Ilyich let out a last sigh. His face fell back and went terribly white. He let out a wheeze. His hands dropped. Ilyich, Ilyich, was no more. Now the battle for the control of the USSR was to start in earnest. Join me next time to follow the rise of a man whose brutal, murderous reign would dwarf that of any Tsar before him, Iosif Vizyanovich Dugashvili, Joseph Stalin. Now today's featured individual came down to two people, Mikhail Kalinin, who signed the document creating the USR, USSR, and Felix Druzhinsky. I picked the latter as he was to die 20 years before Kalinin, and he was instrumental in both Lenin's tenure and Stalin's. Born Felix Edmundovich Druzhinsky on September 11, 1877, in the town of Ivanets in present-day Belarus. He was the son of a noble family, and his father was a teacher of physics in Taganrog, Russia, where Alexander I had supposedly died. His father passed away when he was just five years old, and his family decided to move back to Ivanets. Felix was a very bright young man, fluent in Polish, Russian, and Hebrew. Early on, he was interested in revolutionary ideas and was expelled from his school a few months before graduation. By 1896, he was already deep into Marxist theory, helping to find, found socialist groups in Lithuania and Poland. He was arrested numerous times because of his radical ideas and organizing strikes, as well as setting up illegal presses. After escaping from prison twice, he fled to Berlin, where he was to meet other European radicals. But by 1904, he was in Switzerland, but the time there was not a happy one, as his fiancée, Julia Goldman, died in his arms of tuberculosis. He felt that nothing in life was going right, and then the Russian Revolution of 1905 occurred. Although the revolution eventually failed to topple the Tsar, and Dzerzhinsky was again arrested, he had a new meaning in life. He escaped from prison yet again, which led many to believe that he was a double agent, giving information to the Tsarist secret police, the Ochrana, as well as agitating for revolution. This is highly likely, and would have been his doom had he lived longer. Now, back in Poland, he married Sofia Muzgat, a fellow revolutionary, and quickly had a child. Sofia was arrested while pregnant, though, and sent to Siberia. But before she was sent, they had a child, and Felix took the boy and was on the run until his eventual arrest in 1912. This time, he was not to escape. For the next four and a half years, he was in prison, oftentimes being beaten and chained, which caused his jaw and mouth to be disfigured. It also hardened the man, who was to be known as Iron Felix. Released from prison after the 1917 revolution, Dzerzhinsky joined the Bolshevik party and became a member of the Central Committee, as well as an enthusiastic backer of Vladimir Lenin. Lenin, for his part, viewed Felix as a key element in his plans for the future, as well as a revolutionary hero. In December 1917, Dzerzhinsky became the head of the dreaded secret police organization, the Cheka. As head of the Cheka, Dzerzhinsky had tens of thousands of people executed as purported enemies of the revolution. He was not above using torture to extract confessions from prisoners, 
as well as having them implicate others. Nothing was out of the question in protecting the revolution, according to Felix. In 1926, after Lenin's death, Dzerzhinsky was giving a two-hour speech to the Bolshevik Central Committee denouncing Trotsky, Zinoviev, and Kamenev. Shortly after the speech, Felix Dzerzhinsky died of a heart attack. Stalin, of course, eulogized him and made him an object of hero worship, something he was to do a number of times in the future. According to Montefiore in his book Stalin, The Court of the Red Tsar, Stalin said of Dzerzhinsky, he was a devout knight of the proletariat. Knowing Stalin, though, had Dzerzhinsky not died then, a bullet in his head ordered by Comrade Stalin would have been his fate. Well, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. Please join us at the Russian Rulers Facebook site to ask a question, leave a comment, or make a suggestion. And as always, that's Vidanya. Y спасибо большое.